You just want to know what's hard. <laughs> okay, so we'll resume sort of where we left off there. So uh, people asked some questions that sort of address some of this stuff, so I'll just cover it again, and uh, just feel free to interrupt with, with more questions. Um, so some of this we'll cover what we sort of just talked about at the end there. Um, but here are uh, the basic uh, uh, standard transaction types. Actually, now that I look at my list, I'm, I'm leaving one off because I don't have op return listed as one of the standard transaction types, and it is, it is standard. So I'll explain what these are, what are the standard transaction types and standard script types, because they're pretty much the same. So pubkey hash is the one, sort of like pretty much the original transaction. Or the, you know, it's, it's the one that people have most used for the entire history of Bitcoin. Um, and still use. Uh, many people today are converting to uh, pay to script hash multi-sig. Uh, however, I think as of today, most Bitcoins are still secured using single signature pubkey hash you know, outputs. Um, so this is just what that looks like, and we ran through the, the script interpreter of that. Um, another type, which is also, you know, has been used since the beginning, uh, is pubkey. So rather than pay to the hash for public key, you pay to the public key directly. Um, the difference is that in pay, uh, pubkey hash, you have only the hash of the public key rather than the public key itself. So pubkey is slightly simpler. I can only imagine that the reason why, and I, you know, Satoshi programmed, as far as I'm aware, the original pubkey hash transaction. Probably his reason was in case there's any flaw in the public key cryptography that he's using, maybe it's not such a wise idea to broadcast indefinitely to everyone what the public key is. Um, so most transactions do not reveal what the public key is until you go to spend. But in any case, here's what a pub key transaction looks like. It's simple. All you do is you pay to a public key, then you push the public key, or yeah, then you, you or, yeah, you pay to a public key, then you push a signature, or push a signature to the stack, yeah, whatever. Pay to public key, object sig, then when the scripts are actually executed, push signature to the stack, push public key to the stack, up check sig. Very, it's much simpler, but if there were a flaw in, in the public key cryptography, it's more vulnerable uh, to that. Um, so there's also bare multi-sig. This is before the era of pages for cache. You used to have to pay to a complicated output. So we see like the script uh, pub key there. You used to have to actually put that in the output. And if you can still do this today. I think this is still regarded as being a valid transaction. However, it's very cumbersome because you can't just give someone an address to pay to. You have to say, please plug in this complicated script. Um, so it's just, it's, it's kind of messy. Um, so uh, in this case, so this is just sort of what it looks like. Uh, you, know, you see M, push the three public keys to the stack, N, object multi said. The signature looks the same, except there's an extra op zero because there's a, there's a famous bug, one of the Many irritating bugs that are just built into the Bitcoin protocol is that op check multi sig pops one too many items from the stack. So anytime you do multi sig, you have to push an extra nothingness, an op zero, a blank value to the stack just to uh, just so that op check multi sig doesn't invalidate your transaction. So pay to script hash multi sig is what most people probably should be doing today to secure their Bitcoins. Um, so multi-sig, in a nutshell, as I sort of explained when I explained what BitGo does, our whole company is based on multi-sig. We provide a multi-sig service for people. Um, this lets you have basically different private keys on completely independent computers. And there's no central point of failure. So you can sign a tr transaction with one key here, finish signing it on another computer, and if one computer is violated, your Bitcoins are not stolen. So it's, it's real, you know... Uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's, it's no central point of failure. So it's, it's just almost always uh, a better approach um, than uh, having a single uh, private key. Um, and the difference with pay to script hash is that, okay, so the script pub key is actually this weird looking thing of op hash 160. Then the hash of the redeem script and then op equal verify. The redeem script is actually serialized and contained inside the script sig. So it's another way that to really understand this, you have to run, run through it, look at the script interpreter and stuff, but there's just a, an extra script that gets run, which is the redeem script. Uh, after the script, uh, yeah, after the script pub key is run, the redeem script is deserialized and, and executed. So it's, it's run at the end. Um, and then op return, this is, you know, you would put op return in an output. Op return, 
the operation immediately invalidates your transaction, so you would like normally never use this unless like you have some if statements and you say if they're doing it wrong, invalidate the transaction. Um, the way op return outputs work is you place the op return uh, first, so anybody who ever runs it immediately would invalidate the transaction. So they're unspendable. They're provably unspendable. You can absolutely know that if you send bitcoins to an op return output, no one's ever going to be able to spend those bitcoins ever again. You could burn bitcoins this way uh, if, if you wanted to, or accidentally did it, I guess. Um, and the way this output works is, if you send zero bitcoins to an op return output, then you can just include extra data in that script. And so this is useful for colored coins and uh, just miscellaneous other uses of the blockchain where for whatever reason you want to put a small amount of data in the blockchain, use an op return. And this is considered standard. So people were including data in the blockchain in weird other ways. And uh, we wanted a uh, provably prunable way to store data in the blockchain so that people wouldn't store data in less desirable ways. So it's still not really desirable to put a bunch of data in the blockchain because everybody has to store the blockchain and it's limited in size. Um, but if you do, this is, this is the way to do it. And isn't that still like relatively controversial? There's a good group of people that are saying stop doing it? Sure, yeah. So is it controversial? The answer is yes. It, it, it is and has been controversial. Um, however, the community did ultimately decide to make this a standard transaction. Uh, and the reason being is people are putting data in the blockchain anyway, and they're doing it in worse ways. So they would do it by sending data to public keys that were uh, just random data. So they're unspendable. And the difference is that now you have to keep these unspent outputs. You don't realize that it's just data that someone's storing. You, it looks like a normal output. And the you know, Bitcoin core was holding these in memory. So rather than using a disk space, it was actually using a memory. With op return, if you notice it's op return and you don't care about it, no one can ever spend it. You don't need to hold that transaction in memory or even on disk if you don't care about delivering the blockchain to anyone. You can just delete it. So it's a lot better. Basically, if, if you don't want, if you want to minimize the amount of data you have to store, you can just delete op returns. Um, so this, the, uh, so here are the standard transaction rules. So this, there, there's a difference between like the core Bitcoin protocol, which determines whether a block or whether a transaction can get in a block or not, and what constitutes a valid transaction. Which is different from if you're a node on the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, do you choose to relay a transaction that someone is trying to broadcast? And there are standard transaction rules that determine whether people relay transactions or not. And you can run whatever rules you want to run, but if most people on the network are running the same standard rules, then you know, if you try to broadcast a transaction that val invalidates you know, those rules, then it's not going to reach anyone. You won't be able to mine it. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so uh, non-standard transactions can still be valid, but you have to actually be a miner or be in contact with a miner to, to get it uh, uh, mined. Um, all right, so we've basically covered transactions. Uh, so in the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about blocks, and then I'm going to give code examples that sort of just go back and, and show you actual real working examples of some of this stuff. So blocks are a list of transactions. That's the notion of a block. Um, it has some metadata, like, a, like the, the time is in, is in the block, list of transactions, and then a block header. The block header has uh, the hash of the previous block, so that's why it's a chain, because you can follow the hashes all the way back to the genesis block. Um, and it contains a Merkle root of the transactions list, and so I'll explain what this is and why it has that in it. So, uh, uh, BitTorrent had a, yeah, there's a question over there, yes? So, is there a limit on the number of transactions a block can have? Uh, so the question is, is there a limit on the number of transactions a block can have? As far as I'm aware, there's no limit on the number, but there is a limit on the size. So uh, you can't have more than, well right now it's one megabyte per block. So that's built into the Bitcoin protocol. So if the total number of transactions in a block exceeds that, then the block is invalid. So you can't have a, a single transaction that's larger than that. Um, if you have a whole bunch of small transactions, I don't know what the smallest transaction size is. Kilobyte, um, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know. But um, you could fit many, but you're still limited by the total size of a block. So there's no number that I'm aware of, but you're still limited. Um, so Merkle trees. So so BitTorrent is a decentralized um, 
final <coughs> distribution system. Yes, there's a question. So follow up on that. So if there are more transactions, so let's say we use uh, we find one of big companies payroll, and they are writing a check for all the employees, right? So some the transaction and paying money to ten thousand employees, obviously cannot be in one drop. So how does it work? Okay, it's a great question. So the question is, suppose you want to pay 10,000 people right now. Suppose you want to pay a million people or a billion people right now. Um, how do you do this? Well, each transaction, or maybe you create one transaction with a whole bunch of outputs, um, is pretty big. So like, if you try to pay a billion people, I mean, like, even at one byte per person, that would be a gigabyte. And it would be way more than one byte. So that wouldn't fit in a block. And the answer is, you literally cannot do that with Bitcoin today. You cannot pay that many people. If you try to pay a number of people that's over one of the size limits, you just literally can't do it. You have to, you have to wait. If you want to pay a billion people, you have to run the numbers and say, why well, there's one block every 10 minutes, and each block can have one megabyte of data. Compute how, many, how large your data is, and figure out, well, I need to get all of my transactions in every single block for the next 30 days to be able to pay all the people that I need to pay. So in a nutshell, it's not possible because the, the Bitcoin protocol limits the size of the block. So this is an issue in the Bitcoin world because many of us would like Bitcoin to be more widely adopted, but it doesn't scale right now. Like it, it wouldn't be possible. So nobody is using for payroll right now. People are using for payroll. I I, uh, I got paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> yes. So the, the exactly. So they they pay like ten people or something, right? So. The, the average, I think the, if you run the numbers, the average, or no, not the average, but the peak number of transactions is, I think it's seven per second. So you can't pay more than that right now. Like, you have to do something else. You either have to have a separate ledger. Uh, you can use something like Ripple or Stellar um, to have another, something that's decentralized. I mean, it's debatable whether they're really decentralized or not. Um, but right now, the network doesn't support that many transactions. So you couldn't do payroll with real Bitcoin transactions to 10,000 people. Yes. Uh, who makes the block? Is it the miners that record the transactions and make the block, or how does it work? So the question is, who makes the block? Yes, the miners make a block. So when you want to spend Bitcoin, you have a list of unspent outputs. That is, people who had previously paid to your address. You've got an output that says, you know, um, blah, 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 op dupe, op hash 160, all that stuff. And then you have a private key that corresponds to the public key whose hash is, is that address. So you construct a new transaction that spins that output, and you broadcast it to your peers in the network. Now, the way most people do this in practice is, like, um, you're probably not connecting to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, I don't know the numbers on this, but I would say probably most people run some type of service or something where they're not themselves literally broadcasting a transaction. But whether you are or not, you're sending the transaction to somebody who's then broadcasting it to the network. That is, somebody at some point is sending it to a node on the peer-to-peer -peer network, and the nodes send it to their nodes, or to their peers, and so on, until basically everybody has it. So the miners pool up the transactions. So they look at the, whatever transactions have already gotten in blocks. They don't need to keep those in memory. And they pool the new transactions that have not yet gotten in the block. And they create a block, and they mine it. And if they are lucky, they get, you know, they're able to mine that block, and then they get the free Bitcoins that they get uh, from, from that. So the answer is miners create the blocks. And they can put whatever transactions they want to put in. Okay. First, they verify the transaction with a disk, correct? Then they put it into the block? Or... Yeah, yeah. So the question is, do they validate it before putting it in a, in a block? Yes. They absolutely want to be sure that the transaction is valid. Because if it's invalid, then when they brought, they do all this work of mining a block, and they win, yay, I got the block board, and block, uh, broadcast the block, and then everybody else rejects it, they don't get any money. So uh, they validated first, and they would not bother putting in an invalid transaction in a block, because it would ruin everything they're trying to do. This question is about uh, putting non-payment related transactions in blockchain. So what's the input and output for something that's not payment. So the question is, what is the input and output for something that's that's not a normal payment? So it's it's always a payment because the values are always in the outputs. So you're paying something. You're paying one satoshi. There's a what the standard transactions rule uh, rules include uh, a limit that says you have to pay at least 568 satoshis or something like that, 
or it's not valid, or it's not standard. So you're always paying something, um, but then you can do whatever you want to do. There, there, you can combine the Bitcoin scripting opcodes and stuff and do something fancy, but it's, there's still a payment. You're locking up money, or you're, you're paying money to someone under some conditions that says you must meet these conditions in order to spend this, but um, there's always a payment. So if, you, if there's a... I mean, for non-payment type transactions, and if you put the, the least possible uh, pay output uh, in it, uh, what incentives do the uh, miners have to pick pick those transactions up? Okay, so the question is, if, if you basically if you don't pay a fee, what's the incentive for miners to mine a, a transaction? So another thing, I can't remember if, if this is in my slides or not, but so the fee of a transaction is defined as uh, the value sent into the inputs minus the value being sent by the outputs. And there's this extra amount that if you don't spend it, is the fee. The miners can spend that value, and so they get it as a fee. So what if you don't include a fee? Well, right now, most miners, I'm pretty sure, I mean, they, they can sort of do whatever they want to do. Like, if they do want to accept it, they can. If they don't want to accept it, they don't have to. The only thing they can't do is they can't accept an invalid transaction because then they wouldn't get any bitcoins. Um, so if they don't like you or something, they can, you know, uh, not put your transaction in the block. Other miners might put it in the block. Um, so there's, I guess the question would be, you know, uh, uh, what happens if a miner decides to stop including transactions in a block? They could do this, um, but you would just have to pay a fee, and then probably they're going to put it in a block because they get paid. So, you know, there are plenty of transactions in the blockchain that have zero fees associated with it. But you're taking a bit of a risk constructing such a transaction uh, because it might take a while before it ever gets in a block. Um, how does the network prevent someone, let's say, uh, submitting thousands or millions of transactions into the network? from uh, preventing other people's uh, transactions from being processed. So like a den denial of service to okay. other people. Okay, yeah, I mean, so what's to stop people from broadcasting many, many, many transactions and performing a denial of service on, on the network? So this is, I guess it's possible, like if you, if you broadcast, I mean, you'd have to have a whole bunch of in, uh, unspent outputs to do something like that. Like, if you send, you, you know, a transaction that's not valid, that comes from a nothingness uh, transaction, uh, the nodes will see, well look, it refers to a hash that does not exist, or it refers to an, an unspent output that's been spent or something like that. So they would just immediately discard that transaction. So you'd have to, in practice, to really sort of mess with people, you'd have to sit, spend real Bitcoin basically to do this. Um, and there's, there's nothing stopping you other than various, uh, uh, like the standard transaction rules are pretty much specifically designed to prevent stuff like that. So that's why there's a, a Satoshi uh, limit on the output of a transaction. If you don't spend at least enough Bitcoins, it's not standard. And so you know, people will just immediately toss your transaction into the trash. So you can do stuff like that. Like you could, you, know, you could connect with a node and just flood them with invalid data. So the answer is, like, like any type of DOS attack, like there are plenty of attacks you can do. And if somebody out, you know, goes out of their way to do an attack, we have to figure out some new defense for it and you know, try to prevent it. So it is possible to attack the network. But so like, uh, for example, what if someone sent out a million uh, transactions that were each a thousand Satoshis? Like, would those be nominal amount for the transaction? So if you, if you send, yeah, if you, if you try to create a transaction that spends two, like a single Satoshi, that's not standard. So you either, you would just have difficulty getting that mine. Now people do, like I've received one Satoshi, like there's, uh, for people who have used Bitcoin, uh, you might have received at some point like a one Satoshi value out of nowhere. No one really knows who the hell this is, why, why is somebody spending me one Satoshi? I don't, it's, I don't actually know the answer, I don't know who, who sent me one Satoshi. Uh, it is possible though, and they did it. Uh, some people have speculated that somebody's sort of spying on the network, because if a node has that unspent output, they be behave slightly different. Um, so you can basically know who has an address corresponding to the address that you're sending to. If they're running a full node, due to just privacy problems with Bitcoin Core, it's a minor privacy flaw. Um, so yeah, I mean you can you can do all that type of stuff. I mean it's 
There have been DOS attacks on, on Bitcoin, and the response has been to either add new transaction rules or you know, standard transaction rules, never change the Bitcoin protocol, and usually, usually not change the Bitcoin protocol. But yeah, there are attacks, and you can do it, and people just keep, it's, it's an arms race. Right? If, if people are committed to attacking the network, we'll have to come up with a new defense. Um, so back to Merkle trees. Um, so uh, BitTorrent, I, I use BitTorrent as an example because I feel like it should use Merkle trees. I don't think it actually does, to the best of my knowledge, again, unless somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. At least the original Bit, uh, BitTorrent protocol did not use uh, Merkle trees. But it would have been perfect because what, uh, <clears throat> so BitTorrent has a problem that you want to download a whole bunch of data from random people on the internet and you need to know that you've actually received the data that you want to receive. Um, so one way to do this is with hash functions. You could hash all the data, but then you have to download all the data first before you know if it's accurate, which means what if somebody's sending you one byte somewhere that's wrong? Um, you wouldn't know until the very end. Um, so another way to do this is to hash data in pieces and then compare the hashes. This is a totally acceptable way to do it. As far as I'm aware, this is what BitTorrent does. Um, but this is still not desirable because the hashes can be large. Um, and, and it scales with you know, the size of your data. So Merkle trees let you uh, basically have one hash that authenticates all the data. You can download pieces of data within your data, validate that they're an actual, you know, that it's a valid piece without having the rest of the data and without necessarily downloading you know, a huge number of hashes. And you can just, you know, you can work out, so let's suppose you have a hash of uh, each piece of data, so you can break it up into arbitrary sizes, take the hash of those hashes in pairs, and then take the hashes of those hashes in pairs, and so on, until you get one root, you know, what's called the, the Merkle root, sort of master hash. That authenticates your data, the hashes better come out that way, or something went wrong somewhere. Um, yeah. So, and this, this lets you validate whether a data, a piece of data is in, you know, set in O login. Um, so here is an example of how this is used in Bitcoin. So blocks have a Merkle root. We have uh, you know, there's a Merkle tree of transactions. So you can know whether a transaction is in a block without necessarily downloading the entire block. So you know that the hash of the block, and you know the the Merkle root of uh, the uh, of the transaction list. So you can download the transaction. You also need to download the hashes sort of up the tree. And then you can validate that the transaction is in the list without having to download all this other stuff. So the bolded things are the things you have to download, the unbolded things you don't have to download, and you can verify that your, your transaction is in a block. So this is valuable for something called SPV nodes, which let you, which are sort of like a light Bitcoin node, so it's not a full node, it's light. This lets you be paid in Bitcoin and know you've been paid in a pretty secure, decentralized way without needing to download the entire, whatever it is today, 25, 30, 40 gigabytes, however big the blockchain is today. Um, so, Merkle trees are, are very useful. Um, so, uh, uh, a note on hashes, I think I'm, I might have covered this before, but hashes are often reversed. So they're, they're, when you hash a transaction, it's a normal hash, but then, because Satoshi is messing with us, he displays the reverse of that uh, uh, transaction hash, and that's the transaction ID. Uh, I think the reason why he did this is that uh, the hashes, when they're interpreted as a number, are interpreted as little Indian numbers, and it just makes more sense to people to show them a big Indian number. Um, so when you look at the hash of a block, this makes perfect sense, because uh, you want the hash of a block to be low for it to have high difficulty. So it needs to start with a bunch of zeros. It's very weird to think of it as being a low value if it ends with a bunch of zeros. So I think that's why Satoshi did it. He probably just did little Indian sort of in the protocol, and then when he went about displaying values later on, he's like, well, things are backwards. Let me just reverse it. So I think that's what happened. But in any case, you have to be aware that the hash uh, is the reverse of the, of the ID. Um, so the way mining works is you have to produce a hash of the block that is lower than some other value. So here's an example target. It's a value. 
you want to produce a hash, and I don't know if you can see the numbers because they're kind of small, but this hash is lower than the target. So if your hash is lower, then it's valid. And the way you do this is, because hashes are deterministic, there's a nonce value in the uh, uh, block that you can iterate to produce a different hash. So the, the transactions can stay the same. Miners just iterate the nonce. The nonce is not big enough, so miners also do things like reorder the transactions in the list. Um, so that they produce a new hash value, and they keep doing stuff like this over and over again until they produce a value of the hash that starts with a whole bunch of zeros and is lower than uh, the target. Actually, I called it a hash. That's a mistake of mine. This is an ID, because the ID is the reverse of the hash. So, yeah. uh, You said the nonce isn't big enough. Is it, is it mathematically guaranteed that a hash exists then by reordering and all these tricks that people do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could probably try to work it out. So the, the nonce... I think is four bytes. So if you look at, like, let's look at how many zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think it's a real block hash. So it starts with eight zeros. So if you iterate a single four byte nonce, the probability that you're going to get a hash that starts with eight zeros is extremely small. You need way more random data. But you can easily do this by like reordering the transactions and stuff. So if you just do that, you can, you can run the numbers or combinatoric stuff. Like you, can, you can produce very, 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 very low hashes. There's plenty of data to get a full 256 bits of randomness that you can, you can guarantee that you can get arbitrarily low uh, hash, hash values if you, if you have the time to, to spend on that. Just, just through the reordering process? Alone. Yeah, just through reordering. Reordering the transactions. I mean, yeah, it's, if you think about it, like it's, it's combinatoric, but how many you have a list of a thousand transactions. How many different ways are there to reorder the transactions? Right. It's pretty high. Right? So I guess that's also a reason not to try to mine nearly empty blocks. Um, yes, you're right. So the question is, that's a reason not to mine empty blocks. Actually, I never thought about that before. Like, if you try to leave the blocks empty, there's not enough randomness. Like, the nonce isn't big enough. So you pretty much have to include transactions in a block just to get enough randomness that you can achieve the difficulty target. That's a great point. It does happen. I've and actually looked into this. It does happen. There are miners out there who deliberately add additional blocks. Okay, who, who add additional, even additional transactions to a block. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, what is the target? I mean, like, uh, how does the miner know the target is? I, I sort of cover that. Okay, so I'll just explain. Let's see, is it next thing? Yeah, okay, so here, here it is. So the, the, um, the target is determined. So I don't, I don't know the actual algorithm, like, memorized. Um, but what it is is you want to guarantee that um, the block should always be approximately every 10 minutes. And so every two weeks, if you run the numbers, how many blocks is that? That's a certain number of blocks. Every so blocks, you look at how much time did it take for the previous blocks to, um, to be found. If it took less time, then you need to increase the difficulty because the miners are too good. If it took too much time, that means the miners aren't good enough, you need to decrease the difficulty. So there is an algorithm that does this. Um, I don't know the details, but that's the summary. It, it's, it's always such that a uh, block should take about 10 minutes for a new block. So as people bring new computers online, every two weeks we get a new adjustment that changes the difficulty so that it always takes about 10 minutes. On average, it's like 9.5 minutes because Mining has increased in power, so every two weeks the difficulty adjusts, you know, upwards. So on average, it's like 9.5 minutes or something. Yeah. Uh, there's <clears throat> so here's what a block header looks like. There's a version byte. There's a uh, there's the hash of the previous block, the Merkle root, the time. The time is not necessarily accurate because miners can put whatever time they want in there within a short window for it to be considered valid. Um, so it can be off by as much as like two hours, but in any case, there's a time put in there that's roughly accurate. Uh, the bits, what was the bits? Oh, right, so this is a compact form of the mining target. So this is another sort of weird number format that Bitcoin uses. It's a floating point value in a custom format that's four bytes long. And so that is converted into the uh, target. Uh, and then the, uh, the notch, which is four bytes. And as we said, it's usually not enough randomness, so people will do things like reorder the transactions. 
Um, and so finally, so here's what a block looks like. It starts with a, a, a magic number. Um, this is, for, for network reasons, um, uh, it sort of a, looks like a random number, but it's a very appropriate number to start network data with because it's unlikely to recur frequently and has some network properties or something. But it looks just like a random number. It always starts with that. The size of the blocks, um, which is a uh, uh, 32-byte little ND number, the block header itself, the number of transactions, and then the list of transactions. So that's it. It's basically a list of transactions plus uh, random data, basically the Merkle, uh, Merkle root of the transactions and the, uh, the hash of the block itself, or the hash of the, hash, hash of the previous block. Um, okay, so validating a block, we have to make sure all the transactions are valid. Uh, we have to make sure the proof of work is below the target. Did they actually mine a real block? You know, if they were faking us out, they didn't put any work into it, then it's not for real. Um, you have to check that the size of the block is less than one megabyte, which is the max block size that we were talking about before. Um, and there are probably, like I, I didn't try to write a comprehensive list, um, but uh, this is another one of those cases where it's really, really tricky to make sure you get the exact right rules. So I don't pretend to know what all the, the detailed edge cases are in the Bitcoin protocol. If you really want to know it, you have to just read the source code. And even then, you probably will miss some of the details. Um, you have to read the source code of the dependencies, and the dependencies of your dependencies, and so on. Uh, Otherwise, there might be some obscure edge case somewhere in one of your dependencies. It doesn't do what you think it does. It does something different, um, including you know the C++ standard. You know, what is your compiler really doing when it compiles this program? So, if there's any case in Bitcoin where it does something like either maybe it's seg faults, maybe there's a bug. You know, imagine if, if you could send a transaction that would seg fault every running Bitcoin core full node. Is that a valid transaction or not? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but like if, you know. Uh, certainly, no one's going to be accepting that transaction to a block because they can't because they said fault every time you try to do it. So if your full node accepts it as valid, well, you're wrong because no one will accept that transaction as valid. So it's very tricky to get the rules exactly. Um, uh, now, miners, and we've covered this a lot, but uh, miners can pick their own policy. They can accept whatever transactions they want to accept into a block, um, and they do. So they really do whatever they want to do. They do what's in their interests. They want to be profitable. Um, so some miners have like morals, and uh, Luke Jr. of Eligius is sort of famous for this. He discriminates against things he doesn't like. He doesn't like counterparty, so he doesn't accept them. He doesn't like Satoshi Dice, so he doesn't accept those transactions. So he has like his own rule set. Other miners will accept them, and if those miners mine those transactions in a block, well, that's a valid block, and uh, Luke Jr. will accept it. However, he will not be the one that mines those transactions. <clears throat> um, all right, so I've covered all of this. Um, I'll show you guys some code samples. If there are any questions you can ask, I'm just going to bring up my, my, my code here. What's counterparty transaction? What's counterparty transaction? Uh, so counterparty is a, I'm not sure what to call it. It's, a, it's an extra system built on top of Bitcoin that lets you trade other assets besides just Bitcoin. So it's like color coins in that it sort of colors the transactions and you can do other stuff, includes extra metadata. Um, but it also has um, these other things you can do with it, like you can do contracts and stuff. So it's a pretty advanced system built on top of Bitcoin. And I don't know the reasons why Luke Jr. doesn't like them, but he doesn't, and so he doesn't accept those transactions. But it's, uh, Counterparty, is, it's, a, it's a neat, uh, uh, I guess I'd call it a, a contract system or something, or I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's a cool system built on top of Bitcoin that has all kinds of neat features and stuff, so. <clears throat> Zoom in so you guys can actually see my code. So, where do transactions get queued up until they are picked up? So, where do transactions get queued up until they are picked up? 
And what if nobody picks up how long they last there? Do they expire? So um, it's like not built into the Bitcoin protocol. Um, so miners can do whatever they want to do. They will just store them in memory um, and try to, to mine those blocks. So they're stored in the memory of computers that are running full nodes. So when you broadcast a transaction, you have it. You probably don't delete it from memory. You probably still have it. You send it to some computer that broadcasts it to the network. All those nodes keep it in memory. Uh, unless, they're, unless they want to do something weird and different, they're probably just keeping it in memory. Uh, until a block is found that has it, and they can do things like, um, uh, if you already know a transaction is, like you've already validated that transaction, then you don't have to bother validating it again when you receive a block that contains that transaction. I don't know what all the rules are in, in Bitcoin, but in a nutshell, um, it's just stored in memory of the computers that have it, uh, most especially including the miners. Okay, so let me go back to my slides here and just so you guys can see the link here. So this is, this is on my GitHub. Um, I wanted to, so I had, had made the slides and I just wanted to show stuff. So I, I, I made some examples using some of my own source codes. I used my own library, but then I just wrote some interesting examples. And they are available here, github.com slash ryanxcharles, if anybody wants to, to follow along. You do have to have Node installed to run them. And uh, I created this blockchain university repo that has uh, code examples that, that cover this stuff. So I have two interesting examples I'll go through. Um, can people see this code? Is this like a good font size, or do I need to increase the size? Okay. Something else with a back. No? Yeah. Because yeah. it's layered. It's layered. It's okay. Yeah. Let me. Your preferences. Uh, I will change the transparency. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'll show you this one first. So I created two uh, examples. One is called transaction, one is called block. So this just shows uh, basically parsing and validating a transaction. So I'm using my own library here, so I pull in my full node uh, sort of classes that, that understand Bitcoin stuff. So I feed it in this transaction I found. This is a real valid transaction. This is the same transaction I showed in the slides. So this is the hex form of it. I can uh, parse the transaction by reading it in. Um, I want to confirm that I have the hash value correct. Um, so I do that. And I want to confirm that the ID is the reverse of the hash. So I do that as well. Um, I want to confirm that there's one input. And I'm basically confirming that I'm parsing this transaction correctly. Confirm that there's one output, because there is. Um, gather the, the input. So uh, I, had, I went and used a, an API to, to go download this. I didn't run Bitcoin for my computer. So the input is just this random, enormous transaction. So this is the input transaction. Um, I parse that one. I confirm that the ID is accurate, that I've downloaded the right transaction. Um, I confirm, let's see, I, I retrieve the script, which I already had, and I confirm that the script is accurate. And finally, I add this stuff into my transaction builder, which can validate the transaction. And then I check to see whether it's valid or not. So I actually run the scripts. Um, and then, just to make sure that things are really working, I try changing the transaction, transaction slightly by changing uh, the input script to uh, be an op return. And that should make the transaction invalid. So let me run this code here. So it just ran it, and it just prints out this, this stuff. So it prints out what the, the transaction hash is that I'm looking at. It prints out the transaction ID, which should be the reverse of it. And I think it is. It's A9, A9, and it's reverse sort of byte-wise, which is why it's the A and the 9 are in the same order. One input, one output. Here's the input ID. Here's the script pub key. So this gets executed second. Here's the script sig, which is executed first. And then this actually ran the script interpreter. And it, it actually not just ran the script interpreter, it ran the check transaction function, which validates, are there no duplicate inputs? Are there no null inputs? And do the, the script interpreters evaluate the true? And the answer is yes. It's a valid transaction. 
And then I modified it to change the transaction to have an op return in the input, and that is not valid because, of course, you can't have an op return. Op return immediately invalidates the transaction. <clears throat> so you can sort of play with this if, if you have any interest in that. And so this is you know, real. This is a real transaction pulled from blockchain. I'm really validating it, and <clears throat> there it is in a nutshell. So here's example number two. Um, so this one's very simple. What this does is I took the genesis block and I parsed it and I print out uh, this, the data contained in the input script. So who knows what happens when I print out the data contained in the input script of the, of the genesis transaction of Bitcoin. The very first, no, you know what it is. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll print this out. It says, the Times 03 Jan 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So this is the data contained in the very first um, you know, block, the very first transaction, the very first block. This is the secret message placed by Satoshi, which sort of gives perhaps a hint about why Bitcoin exists. So this is it. So that's, uh, you can see how to get what that message is and print it out. Um, all you have to do is find the, the genesis block and then parse it and print it out. There you go. So, uh, so that's it. So those are the examples. That's my talk. Let me go look at, did I have any other slides here? I think that's basically the end. Oh, I do have some homework assignments for people. Some of them are easy and some of them are extremely, extremely hard. Uh, some of them are parsing numbers and stuff like that. And then I also added implement Bitcoin to the list of, of homework assignments. So. <laughs> Right. Yes. So when the uh, the miners are looking for a nonce that will solve the block, if the block is the block is always changing because new transactions are being added to the block, so then does the miner have to start over looking for a new nonce every time there's a new transaction? No, they don't start over. So um, the, the the hash value is basically random. So it's like gambling. Like it's there's just based on what the uh, target is, there's a certain probability of if you compute one hash, what is the probability that you're going to get it, right? It's like one in however many zeros that it is, basically. So uh, they don't have to do anything, right? It's, it's, it's just random. So they don't have to start over. They can. I don't know why they would. So they don't start over. They just add more transactions to the list. But is the, but is the nonce tied to the hash of the block at any given time? The nonce is not tied to the, to the hash of the block. The nonce can be anything. So there's no validation done on the nonce. If I get a block, I allow any conceivable value of those four bytes. It doesn't matter. All that matters is, does the hash come out accurately? That is, are they not lying to me? And they, they have actually accurately produced this hash. If it comes out correctly, we'll get it. Yes? Um, so this is you first. Why is the entire blockchain stored on every node? Why does it? So um, I guess th they actually don't necessarily have to. So like it depends on what your goal is. Some people want to run it. Um, I have run it at times. I'm not currently running a full node just because it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a hassle to run one. Um, but uh, if you want to validate transactions, you want to know you have the real blockchain, you need to run a full node that validates every single block. So what you can do is, if you want to do that, you actually don't technically have to store the entire blockchain. As soon as you validated a block and you validated all of the transactions have been spent, then you don't need to remember that block because no one can ever spend those again. You don't need to validate it a second time. So you can delete it and you can sort of stay up to date with, with the latest transactions. Uh, but if you're like, if you want to be a good citizen of the Bitcoin network, you want to be able to deliver the blockchain to people. So that's probably the best reason to keep it so that other people who want it can download it from you and you can share the, the blockchain with them. But you don't have to maintain the entire blockchain. You can fully validate the blockchain and not remember the entire blockchain. Fully option. Um, I was trying to run your example on my computer, I think. Uh, I'm getting an error message. I don't okay, have a module that? installed. Okay, so you just type in npm install. Did you try I, that? I don't know which modules to install. I was wondering if you could oh, actually I think it, I think it just, if you just type in npm install, it will automatically install the correct modules. Oh, yeah. Thank you. In the Blockchain University directory. Yeah, let me know. Cool, if that works. Thanks. Is there a way to 
is, is there a problem? Well, so so the miners can reorder transactions, and they may actually ignore certain transactions if there's no fee uh, included, right? So the the order of transactions is it's not consistent with actual real time, right? So is, does that cause a problem with consistency? Because like I could have sent you one Bitcoin today, but it won't show up into the in the blockchain for a week. But you would have maybe spent that. Um, yeah. So. Um, if you're trying to spend money that's not in the blockchain, then it's not valid. So if you try to, suppose you send me a transaction, and I now want to immediately spend that transaction. You can do that, you can broadcast the, the chained transaction, and I think Bitcoin Core will accept that and keep it in memory. Uh, it might not, I don't quite remember. Um, but it's not actually valid until the input transaction gets in a block. So they'll never occur out of order with respect to the blocks. So at best, a transaction that depends on another transaction can be in the same transaction, but the transaction that comes second can never be in an earlier block. That would never happen because it would be in, it would be invalid. But within a block. Within a block. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I know in the Bitcoin core, they're starting to tease out <coughs> the parts of the software that are uh, critical for consensus. Which um, which parts of these uh, you know, logical pieces are included in that? Uh, so the idea is it should be all consensus critical code. That is, when you validate a block, is the block valid or not, that needs to be in this new library. Whether a transaction is standard or not is not a part of the consensus rules, and so that will not be in that library. Now, they should probably create another library for that anyway, just because it's useful uh, for anybody who wants to say run the same standard rules. But the consensus library, the idea of it is that it should be exactly what the consensus critical code is. That is, what rules do you need to follow to be sure that you're not going to go off on a fork of the blockchain? Uh, so that's the idea of that library. It's a very hard problem to solve because, as I was saying, like, how do you know the obscure edge cases of all of your uh, you know, dependencies? So the, the OpenSSL has weird properties that have sort of made life painful for Bitcoin developers because we didn't know at first that it had these weird features, but over time we learned because it bit us because somebody went off on a fork or something and we gradually figured it out. But who knows what other obscure rules are just sort of hiding beneath the surface that we haven't discovered yet. So, but anyway, that's the idea is they're putting the consensus protocol code in the library. So you can then, once they do that, uh, you can then, at least if you're running like a binary that can link in the C++ code, you can run the same exact rules while rewriting everything else. Uh, so about the time stamp, can a taller block have an earlier time stamp than the earlier <coughs> yeah. block? Yeah. So the time stamps, can a, can a, like a later block have an earlier time stamp than an earlier block? Yes. Yes. So that's possible. Because the time stamp is, it only has to be within a two hour window. So you can, somebody can deliberately put a false time in there, and that's valid. So yeah, that can happen. The blocks can have the incorrect ordering of the time, because the time is just not reliable. I think they do. I think there are cases of that. So, so does that mean that in-flight transactions can't survive for more than two hours before all the... No, because they don't... The, so the in-flight transactions uh, only depend on the input transactions. Like, they don't link to a block, you know. So long as the input transaction got in a block, that's all that matters. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't change the... All that really matters is the order of the blocks. Right? So it doesn't matter what time... Ignore the time listed, it's just unreliable. A, a block also stores uh, difficulty, right? Yeah, it, it, it stores the, uh, the bits value um, in the block header. Yeah. So this is like, it's a representation of what the difficulty is. So yes, it's in the block. But uh, that's actually decided by the protocol, right? Yes. Why so it, it better come out correctly. Yeah. So it seems a little bit redundant. Is there a reason why? It does seem redundant. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure why that necessarily must be in a block. It's not very big, so I don't think it's a huge deal that it's there, but it does seem redundant because you should be able to compute it. So I don't know why it would need to be in a block. But yeah, it is.
And so, so the only two things you, I mean, not only two, but the, the two things you can do to make it uh, change the uh, randomness of mining is that you change the amount, and you also can change the order of the transaction. Okay. And yeah. anything else can I change? Yeah, so what can you change in a block to basically iterate, you know, and, and produce a new hash value? You can change what transactions are in a block. Um, let's just look at it and see, because off the top of my head, I, I don't know. You can change all, you know, could you change the version number? Um, I'm not sure what happens if you change the version number. It's probably considered invalid. Like, it's probably, like, probably wouldn't be accepted. So you can't change that. Um, you can't change the previous block hash. Like, that just is what it is. Um, you need to use the latest block or you're, you're not going to be on the largest chain. Um, the Merkle root is, uh, that can ch that's what changes when you change the order or the contents of the transactions or what transactions are involved. The time, you can change the time. Because there's a two hour window, there's, there's some freedom there. I don't know how many bits of, of entropy is there, but you could change that. You could change the time um, and the nonce. You can't change the bits. So these are the things you can change. The Merkle root, by changing the transactions, you can change the time a little bit within two hour window, and you can change the nonce. Say that again. Is it, so, what's, so two hour window of uh, what is the standard? Is it the, the state? This what is it? What is the two hour window? It's if you receive a block. Do you know that this block is valid or not? If the time listed in the block is six years from now, that's invalid. <laughs> but if it's only one hour from now, that's valid. So it has no relation to the lock time within each of the transactions in the block. Uh, does the time have relation to the lock time? Um, not really. So the lock, the in lock time, can be either like a block number or a time. I, I don't think. Actually, uh, actually, it might. I actually don't know. I don't know if the in lock time. I wonder. I actually don't know the answer to that. So that that's a good question because how do you know whether a transaction is past the in lock time? Um, is it the time literally listed in a block? Is it then valid? I'm not sure. So it might be related to that, and it might not. I don't know. Yes? Uh, if two different miners uh, uh, find proof of work on the same block and broadcast it at the same time, uh, on what rules uh, is the proof of work accepted? And uh, how is the reward divided between the two? Or how they, how they Good question. So what happens when two miners mine a block at the same time? Who wins? Well, only one of them can win. So what happens is, if I mine a block, um, I now have the longest chain. Somebody else has mined a block, they also have an equally long chain. The valid chain is the longest. So right now, we don't know which one's the longest. So the miner that mined, you know, each miner is probably going to keep building on their own chain because they want to make sure that they're the ones that get the money. So they'll go on and mine the next block. So they'll pull more transactions, mine a new block, Eventually, one chain will win. Somebody will mine a new block faster than the other one, and one chain will end up being longer. And anytime you detect the longer chain, you disregard the shorter chain. You only care about the longer chain. So who gets the mining reward? It's either one or the other. It's not divided between two. It's, it's win or lose. You either get it or you don't. Um, and the longest chain wins. Uh, so they keep the chain private, or everybody No, you definitely would want to keep it public. You want to broadcast, as soon as you mine a block, you want everyone immediately to have that block so that they can mine the block on top of it so that your chain, so that your block gets embedded in the longest chain. Otherwise, you don't get the money. So what happens to all the transactions which are in the block which wasn't the longest in the chain? So what happens to the, so suppose there's, there's a, you know, one block loses and there's what's called a reorg. A reorg is where you, you're, you're on one chain and you detect you're not on the longest chain anymore. There's another chain that's longer. So you reorg, you get the new chain. What happens to the transactions that were in those other blocks? Well, most of the transactions are probably also in the new blocks as well, because the miners are mining you know, uh, uh, those transactions. Now suppose there is like a transaction that depends on another transaction that was in that block, and they're both in blocks, and only one of them is in the new, like, you know, the only guarantee you have is that um, they're not going to appear out of block order. So if a transaction depends on a previous transaction, it will always appear in the same block or a later block. 
but you know they might be in different blocks. If 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 in one before the reorg you're in the 350,000th block, after the reorg you're on the 350,000th and sixth block, that could totally happen. So they can be in different blocks. They might not be in any blocks. Uh, but if they're not and they're still valid, you can rebroadcast them. Um, all the miners probably keep track of this, so again, I don't know exactly what is written into Bitcoin Core, but probably if there's a reorg, you keep track of the valid, or what were valid transactions, and try to see if they're still valid. And they might not be, because maybe somebody tried a double spin attack. Maybe there's a miner that's got 55% of the network, and they create a new block with a conflicting transaction, and the transaction that was in the, before the reorg is not valid anymore, so that one definitely won't find its way into the yeah. Yeah. So I've heard of, of this concept of shared pool where multiple miners come together to uh, you know, mine a block and then they share the reward. How does that work? Yeah, so the question is about mining pools. How can multiple miners come together and share a, uh, a common uh, reward? So they, uh, there's, there's, there's usually a mining pool operator and people sort of sign up. So the, the mining pool operator has at least a Bitcoin address for who the miners are. And the people in the pool get a uh, sort of work unit from the mining pool operator. So that is, they'll contain like, it's just like a hash. Like they send like the block, uh, they send like the block header or something like that. So the people in the mining pool actually don't know what transactions they're mining. They only know the part that they need to know uh, for, you know, uh, uh, to produce the proof of work. Um, so they work on this. They have to, there's a, there's a tricky issue, which is how do you know that the people in the pool are actually doing work? Well, you use proof of work for this. If you have mining power, you should be able to produce small hashes. Maybe not as small as the mining reward, because that's going to happen very infrequently. But you can at least prove that you're mining with however much power it is by getting by frequently getting low hashes. So that they can prove that they're working on it. Then the mining pool operator, as soon as the mining pool finds a block, one of the people in the, in the thing finds a block. The block sends the money to the mining pool operator. And the mining pool operator must distribute that money uh, to the people in the pool. So usually there's a trusted central party, that's how mining works. Um, and they need to be relied upon to sort of equally distribute the Bitcoins to the people in the mining pool. Um, and there's, there's something called P2 pool, which is a, like, people in, in the Bitcoin world hate centralization, want everything to be decentralized. So how do you decentralize mining? How, how could it be that the mining pool requires somebody at the middle? We hate that. Um, I think P2 pool is a way to address that, although I've never studied it, so I don't know how it works. But in any case, the way most mining pools work is there's a, a central party. Also, some of the miners, like, I'm not sure what the fractions of the mining power of the network are. Probably, roughly speaking, half of the network, at least, is not mining pools. It's like professional miners that have, like, produced their own chips and, you know, have their own data centers. So there's no centralization problem as far as they're concerned. They get all the Bitcoins that they mine. Um, but for the mining pools, yeah, so. Uh, can you determine whether uh, the proof of work is signed by a mining pool or a miner? Do they get a specified uh, ID to identify? So is the proof of work found by the mining pool or the miner? So, uh, so one of the people in the mining pool will find uh, a hash that is sufficiently low to achieve the, the difficulty target. So it's found by one of the people in the pool. So they actually find the new block. Now, they send that to the mining pool operator who says, hey, you got it. Then uh, there's an extra rule on Coinbase transactions. So they, they create this block, they broadcast it, assume it's there. Um, and it actually gets in the blockchain. It, it, it has to be there for something like 100 blocks or something like that. Again, I don't remember the detail, but it has to be there for a while before you can spend the Coinbase transaction. Um, so the, the mining pool operator waits until then and then distributes the reward. Or if they're a sort of, a, I don't know, if they're very professional or something, they, they might have their own pool of funds already available, and they can pay the people in the mining pool before it's ever even you know, uh, valid, but it's, it's one of the two. So um, 
in a nutshell, um, one of the members of the mining pool will find the correct block. Why is proof of work important? Why is proof of work important? Maybe compare like what happens when you lower the difficulty level. Sure. Increase it. Increase the benefit. Why ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. So this is like why is proof of work important? What happens when the company goes up or down? I mean, this is like I, I totally skipped this because like I. I did not give like an overview of what Bitcoin is, but this is obviously absolutely key to what Bitcoin is and how it works. Um, <clears throat> Bitcoin is a way of achieving consensus in a decentralized way. So uh, proof of work is central to making this possible. So if you want to know a transaction is valid or not, you can confirm that the hash is actually the hash of the block. So you know if you have a block, you know it's the correct block. Um, imagine there was no proof of work though, that there was no ONTS, that the hashes could be anything. The miners could just produce new uh, blocks, and person over here wants to get the new money, so they make their own block. Person over there wants to get the money, so they make their block. Everybody would be making their own blockchain. There would be no consensus about what's the correct blockchain. So the solution is, if you actually have to prove you're using real computing power, um, then there's only going to be one blockchain. Because if person over there has less computing power, the person with more computing power can produce a lower hash, and they win. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a way of uh, uh, sort of computationally, algorithmically knowing that one chain is probably the one that's going to win. So that's it. So it's it's absolutely central to what Bitcoin is and, and how it works. It's absolutely critical. Uh, it's sort of a point of debate because not everybody thinks the proof of work is is uh, efficient. They think that you're wasting mining power. Um, I think it sort of remains to be seen. I guess like it is like an experiment, but I think probably proof of work is the best way to do this. I kind of doubt that any of the other strategies will ever work. I think the way proof of work letting you um, sort of algorithmically know whether the blockchain is correct without having to sign up, without having to you know, give anybody your ID or something. You can just run an algorithm that tells you whether this blockchain is the correct blockchain or not. That's, I, I, I bet proof of work is the only way to do that. Um, now, you're, you asked another question, which is sort of what you know, significance does this have to the network? It only matters, like, um, normally you don't care. Like, normally you're running a wallet or something, even if you have Bitcoins, even if you have the private keys to your Bitcoins, you're probably not running a full node. So normally you don't care, but it's, it's very important that you can validate that if you want to, because that's why you don't have to trust anybody to use Bitcoin. If you really want to know you've been paid, you can just download the blockchain and see if that transaction is in the blockchain. Um, so, uh, as far as other implications, I mean, it's purely an auditing thing. Like, I can't think of, I guess there are other implications, like Satoshi picked a value for the time of a block, which is 10 minutes, which is kind of random, it's arbitrary, it could have been shorter, it could have been longer. Um, it needed to be long enough that you have time to send people the latest block before they find the next block, otherwise you'd have reorgs all the time. So it needed to be a few minutes, whether it needed to be 10 minutes or not, I mean, it's just totally random. So that's one impact. Like, you know, if, if Bitcoin didn't have a blockchain, it worked a completely different way, you wouldn't have confirmations. You wouldn't have, is my transaction going to block or not? But, so it, it's, it matters for that. Like, you know, if you've been paid, you do have to understand what a blockchain is and know, has it been confirmed or not? If it hasn't been confirmed, well, maybe you haven't been paid. Um, so it's, 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 it's important for auditing reasons, but you know, when most people use Bitcoin, they probably don't think about it and don't really care, because it, it doesn't actually matter to most people most of the time. I'm not clear on this concept. If I send up a transaction with some very minimal fees and no miner is interested in putting that in a block, and so I I up the fees to a higher level, then I broadcast it again. Um, so is there a possibility that these two transactions are they the same, or would they be processed in yeah. multiple ways? Great question. So let's suppose uh, I'm just going to rephrase your question. You send a transaction with zero fee. 
and it never gets in a block. Two days later, this has happened to like people that I know, and I just like someone say, I sent the transaction, it's not getting a block. What what do I do? Um, and a lot of software like you know won't help you. Like it's just stuck. Sorry, because the software doesn't understand what to do in that case. You can create a new transaction that spends the same uh, outputs, and it's a new transaction. So. You decide, okay, fine, I'm willing to pay a fee because I want this to actually get in a block. So I create a new transaction that has a fee, a small fee, and maybe a big fee because you're like, I really want this transaction to get in a block. Um, you sign that, that's a different and conflicting transaction. So it's a different transaction. Um, it's hard to know is someone trying to double spend or is someone trying to just, yeah. they could get in a block. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a question that doesn't really concern the core Bitcoin protocol. It's about what do most nodes actually do. I think what they do is um, they treat it as a conflicting transaction. So they actually ignore whatever the new transactions are. So if you try to double spend, it, it won't accept the second transaction. It'll hold on to the first transaction, transaction. The catch is that there is an eventual limit where they clear the memory. And also you can send it to a new node that wasn't on the network when you sent the first one or something like that. So right now, it's sort of inconvenient that if you send a transaction with a low enough fee and it never gets in a block, it's pretty difficult to replace it because a lot of nodes will ignore your second transaction because they think you're double spending. Um, so that's where we stand today. There, uh, 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 it has been proposed that we could change like the standard you know, relay rules so that you do replace the transaction if somebody sends a replacement, but you'd be inviting double spends if you did that. You would say, Let's suppose we change the rules so that all nodes accept the second transaction is valid. Then you could easily scam people by paying them. They get a zero confirm. They think they've been paid. As soon as they think they've been paid and give you their product or service, you send a conflicting transaction that sends the money back to yourself. Um, so it wouldn't really be good you know, to, to do things that way. So that's the situation we're in. I'm pretty sure right now, uh, if you try to send a second transaction with a fee, it'll take a while before even that one gets in a block. So you should include some fee the first time around. <clears throat> yes. So how does it determine it's a duplicate transaction? Is it based on the input source transaction, where, who uh, yeah. it is addressed to, and what else? How does it know it's, it's duplicated? So it's, it's uh, you know, an output can be spent one time. So if another transaction comes along that spends the same output as another transaction, well, that Output has been spent. You can't spend it a second time. So it's not, the, the transaction can be completely different. Maybe it only has one input in common with the other one, but one input means that output's already been spent. So it can be a completely different transaction, but what you can't do is you can't spend the same output multiple times. How do we cancel the transaction after I broadcast from one Is it possible for me to say stop this? No. Can I cancel it? You cannot cancel it. If it's valid, yeah. it's valid. Okay. So it, 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 as soon as you broadcast a transaction, there is a good chance it will get in a block. So there's no way to cancel it. I mean, yeah. Um, in the next couple of years, as the computational power increases for all the miners, uh, does the, the complexity level of proof of work probably increase as well? So does that 10 minute limit, is, is that, does that have? No, the 10 minute, the 10 minute limit always stays the same. So the question is, as we add more computing power to the network, every two weeks the difficulty is adjusted again based on how much computing power is on the network. It'll always be about 10 minutes. It'll trend towards 10 minutes. Yes. How does the network rid itself of uh, invalid transactions? Are they all like stored in memory somewhere, or how do you, yeah. how do you clear that? How does the network clear itself of, of like invalid transactions? So I, I think it's more a question of like what does Bitcoin Core actually do? Like um, I think I imagine it just immediately wipes them from memory. Like if it if it knows that that output has been, you know, it sends it's invalid for whatever reason. If it knows it's invalid, it probably just deletes it from memory. It also probably disconnects from that node because if somebody's sending you invalid transactions, maybe they're trying to attack you. So there are some rules around that, which is if, if you detect someone is screwing with you, disconnect from them and don't accept any of their you know, broadcasts. This is a great conversation. We've had a lot of very, very uh, questions. Yeah. Since 
sort of trying to wrap my head around how, how it works. So the, so the proof of work, the, the, the point of it is to kind of throttle the pace of potential invalid data that you have to filter out. Um, it makes it harder to write to the distributed database, in a sense. Yeah. And kind of gives everybody a chance to get rewarded for that work. But why, why is it only the miners who have to pay? Like, like you could imagine having a, a much more lightweight proof of work associated with every transaction before it becomes valid, which would have a similar effect of you know, reducing the, the uh, number of transactions that have to be looked at before um, by imposing a cost whenever anyone tries to send a transaction. Okay, so I guess you're, you're imagining like, <clears throat> I guess I don't know what your question is, it sounds like an idea, like you could, there could be other rules, like is Bitcoin the only way to do this? Could you have a cost on sending a transaction or something like that? Okay. I don't know why not. Um, I think that um, it, when you look into the details of the Bitcoin protocol, it's very, um, it feels like very proof of concept. Like, like all this weirdness as far as whether numbers are big Indian or little Indian and all that stuff, it's very proof of concept. However, the overall idea of it, I think, is actually pretty simple. Um, and I think it might be, details aside, just the simplest way to solve this problem. Um, so just using proof of work on a block is very simple. It seems to solve every problem. Like, Bitcoin still exists. There's a huge bounty for someone to hack Bitcoin. You know, you can steal a bunch of Bitcoins. It's never been hacked. So I think the idea of it is, is basically pretty simple and pretty sound. So, you know, uh, there may not be any need really to have any different rules. Yes? How do you make sure all these things are running an acceptable version of the Bitcoin software? How, how do you know if people are running the same version? How do, you, how do you make sure, like some may be running a buggy or like an older version? Oh. I don't know how it's called that. So how do you know that people are running the same version? You don't know. Uh, you can run whatever version you want. You can run, if you don't like the, the Bitcoin rules, yeah. you can run a node that implements whatever rules you want to implement. So it's very, it's very actually democratic because you, know, it's, you could vote with your own computing power. Now the catch is that if you try to run different rules than what everybody else is running, you either need to convince them to use the same rules, or you're just going to go off on a fork. In a way, like every single altcoin is like, well, we don't like Bitcoin. Let's do something slightly different. But they're all way smaller than Bitcoin because they haven't convinced most people to adopt their different rules. So you don't know if people are running the same version as you or not. All you know is what is the longest chain, and you know, if you want to change the rules, um, nothing's stopping you. It's really just a matter of, of basically achieving consensus that other people should run your version. So you don't know. You don't know what version people are running. Well, in fact, there are some things to say that you ideally want multi things running at you. Mm -hmm. and it's quite evolutionary. That's a good point. Yeah. Do you, do, should people run the same version? I mean, it's probably unrealistic to think that they ever would run the same version because people should want to, you know, do things their own way. Maybe, you know, when, when Luke Jr. Uh, doesn't accept some transactions um, into his, you know, blocks, I think that's, a, that's totally valid. Like, I would probably not choose the same rules that he chooses, but that's, that's how the protocol works. And if he can vote for his preference of what should be considered a, a, tr a, a valid transaction, then that's totally fine. Um, so that's actually good. There's flexibility built into Bitcoin, which is, you know, the protocol can change in any way so long as people actually agree and, and run, by and large, whatever the version of the protocol is. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about confirmations and, um, I guess, particularly why incentivizing or why uh, a double spend to kind of replace the transaction that isn't getting accepted is a problem, um, particular, like relating to the fact that um, having no confirmations is like Sure. Not yeah, so confirmations is like, like how many blocks has your transaction been in? 
if, you're, if you just broadcast your transaction, then it's zero confirmations. And this is another way, like, you know, it's, the number of confirmations isn't really a protocol thing, it's like just a word we use to talk about how, how many blocks it's sort of buried in. Um, so if, if, your blo if your transaction's not in any blocks, so let's suppose somebody pays you, and they send your transaction, and you have a transaction you think you've been paid, but it's not in any blocks yet, they can try to double spend you by creating another transaction if they're connected with the miner or if they didn't broadcast the first one to the network for whatever reason. The second transaction, which doesn't give you the money, it gives the money to somebody else, um, might you know, actually get one confirmation or two confirmations or whatever, and that one becomes valid. Um, so yeah, the confirmations are, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to, to know how confident are you that you've really been paid. If it's zero confirmations, you're not very confident, but if you're six confirmations, you're pretty confident. If you're 100 or more, whatever the, the Coinbase uh, you know, limit is, um, you're quite sure that there's not going to be a reward that deep and that you've really been paid. Does that answer your question? I guess, um, well, you were talking about why it's bad for someone to double spend um, if the first transaction is not getting in. Um, but if you're, if it's not secure with zero confirmations anyway, um, I, I just... Sure, that's a good point. So, so people could double spend by sending a second transaction, and that's bad because you're double spending and trying to scam people. But you shouldn't really be trusting zero confirmation transactions anyway. So, uh, you know, in a way it's your own fault for accepting a zero confirmed If somebody paid you a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and it's like, you instantly get the transaction, like, okay, good, here's your house, or whatever. You know, um, there's just, you know, you, you need to be aware that the, the, uh, uh, there are ways to uh, basically, uh, you know, double spend. I mean, somebody could, could create a conflicting transaction that, that gets in a block and is, is the real transaction. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a question of, so like, the, the rules let you do that. Like, you can double spend in the sense that you can send another transaction. Only one of them will get, will get in the block. And it depends on, does that person accept that transaction or not before they give you whatever they're exchanging it for. Um, so the rules allow that. Um, I would say, I would still argue it's bad <laughs> to double spend even with zero confirms. Just because, you know, you're, what are you, trying to scam somebody? You know, like, uh, um, I think, um, um, I think it's, I would still consider that bad, but I'd also just warn people, you know, look, there's nothing stopping someone from, from double spending, other than the, the network rules that we talked about a minute ago, which is if they've actually broadcast the transaction, it's pretty difficult to get a, a conflicting transaction actually in a block. So, um, yeah, it's, it's bad to scam people, but, it can happen. Yeah. Would you foresee that being a problem if once, you know, let's say Bitcoin becomes widely adopted and it's sort of used at point of sale, so like to buy a coffee, to buy these small little things, where you're not going to sit around and wait 10 minutes to pay for your Starbucks? Like, the fact that all these people could theoretically send like a second transaction really quickly to a whole different set of nodes and then not wait for their coffee. Would that ever be an issue? Yeah. Is that going to stop merchants from accepting Bitcoin? Yeah, so the question is, like, basically, is it, is it an issue that, you know, there are ways to double spend, right? I mean, within short periods of time. Um, I, I, I have a lot to say about it. In a nutshell, it, it's a real issue. Like, you know, you need to be aware of this. If somebody's paying for coffee with Bitcoin, maybe they are trying to scam you. Most of the time, they're probably not trying to scam you. And there are costs to scamming. So you sort of have to weigh, you know, how many confirmations do I need to wait? before I know that I'm probably not being scammed. For buying coffee, it probably doesn't matter most of the time, but I bet somebody would go out of their way to scam to get a cup of coffee just because they can. Um, I would just point out a couple things. One is that the traditional payment system is way, way, way more reversible than Bitcoin is. So although you have to wait 10 minutes, you know, you've really been paid. And with a credit card, you have to wait like six months, otherwise they can reverse you at any later time. So small merchants get affected by this all the time, right? They, they sell a valuable product to someone, that person just calls up the credit card company in a couple weeks and says, hey, I didn't buy this, they're scamming me. And the credit card company reverses the transaction and the little merchant gets screwed. So Bitcoin is way better than that, um, but there's still a genuine issue there, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, I think that, um, 
probably there will be just other technologies on top of Bitcoin that people use. Like today, um, if you use, there are, there are a number of ways, um, basically if you, if you trust like a third party in the mix, you can, you can solve this problem. Um, so if there's somebody in the mix that's willing to guarantee the money, maybe there's insurance or something like that, or they have the money, maybe, maybe the person who's paying is actually not paying, it's somebody else who's paying on their behalf, which you trust and they're not going to scam you. So there are ways to solve it. There are sort of traditional ways. We might have uh, build extra decentralized layers on top of Bitcoin. So Ripple and Stellar are sort of attempts to do that. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know what the, the answer is. I would say that it's a real issue, but it's still way, way, way better than, than the traditional payment system. So one use case I see uh, is like, like old pay phones or old uh, games, like uh, somebody uh, playing the game. You keep adding more coins to extend the time on a call, right? So let's say I'm using Bitcoin now, and I'm going to keep using the same source and giving it to the same uh, destination because it's the gaming machine or that uh, the parlor where it's being played. It might sound like somebody is trying to uh, double spend, but it's not really because it's going to be like every one minute I have to add some security or something like some amount, right? So yeah. it's a valid transaction, valid use case. Yeah. So, so it might look like. Uh, Th that's a great idea. So, uh, just to summarize, uh, so um, you know, what if you you're playing pinball and you want to keep paying, and you're sending from the same pool of money over and over again? You're spending the same unspent outputs. One way to do this is you could just send the transaction directly to the pinball machine, and uh, uh, you know, uh, keep sending them a new transaction that they don't broadcast to the Bitcoin network. They just hold the transaction. And so you can keep sending them an updated transaction. If you send them an updated transaction that takes money away or something like that, and they're like, okay, well, you're trying to scam us, then they broadcast a transaction that guarantees that they've now been paid with whatever. So you can totally do stuff like that. You just have to be aware that, you know, do you broadcast the transaction? Uh, if you do, do people regard it? You know, do they immediately put in the block? Then it's over. You can't keep replacing it. Um, so there's a notion called payment channels, which basically explores this idea in detail which is where you open up a channel with someone and you keep updating a transaction with them and you don't broadcast that transaction uh, you know, to the network, basically. And you just wait until the payment channel is closed there's and also, then you can broadcast. Yeah, there's also a lot of discussion about you know, side chain type stuff for faster transactions, which in effect is like what Apple and other people do, is they aggregate and have a higher, you know, higher standard for a period of time and they take the sum of that at the end and, and then do the, that as a final transaction after some period, so. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's a great point. I didn't mention sidechain before, but sidechains are a totally valid way to solve a lot of these issues. You know, faster transactions, more complicated transactions, smarter scripts and stuff like that. So sidechains are a very, very compelling uh, possibility. Yeah? Could, could that address the, uh, the limitations on like, the employee payroll? Yeah. The issue that we're sidechains about? absolutely can. So like, you know, the size of a block is one megabyte. Like, this is just not big enough for global commerce. But you also wouldn't want it to be really, really, really big blocks because uh, it would become impractical for people to store the entire blockchain. So side chains are a way of having parallel uh, uh, blockchains where you can send real Bitcoin, you lock up real Bitcoin on the main blockchain and access it on the side chain, spend it there, then at a later date, you can lock up the Bitcoin on the side chain and reveal it on the main blockchain. So it basically lets you send Bitcoin from chain to chain. Uh, and then on the other chains, you can change new rules. You don't have to worry about, is everybody agreeing to my rules? You can just make a new side chain. And you can put real Bitcoin on. So you can make 10 megabyte blocks, or 100 megabyte blocks, or a gigabyte block. Um, you can make fancier scripts. You can make a Turing complete scripting language on the side chain that lets you do whatever kind of fancy contracts you want to do that Bitcoin can't do. So sidechains are, are potentially really good. Now, they haven't launched anything yet, uh, but supposedly they will be launching soon. So as soon as they do, I'll, I'll you know, look at it. And what's that um, company? Blockstream. Blockstream is the name of the company that, that uh, is working on sidechains. Who's working there? 
Uh, the people, yeah, Greg, Greg Maxwell. So the people at Block, Blockstream is a really cool and interesting company. It's kind of uh, an interesting uh, uh, kind of a merger of people in the Bitcoin world. Um, so is, is Blockstream sponsoring this thing or something? No, <laughs> they're, uh, no they're really good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot of software in the Bitcoin world, but we all run Bitcoin Core. And Bitcoin Core is maintained by you know, pretty much a handful of, of what used to be volunteer developers. Uh, and they wanted to get paid to maintain Bitcoin. So some of the developers some years ago created the Bitcoin Foundation. And this is a nonprofit organization that may or may not survive, but the, part of the mission of it is to fund core developers. Other core developers joined companies. Jeff Garzik joined BitPay. He, he works at BitPay right now, so he gets funded. Um, and, but there were some other developers that had not gotten funded. Uh, and basically, they got together and created a company called Blockstream, which is like the most Bitcoin of Bitcoin companies you could possibly imagine, because they have like, they have at least two people that have like sort of uh, push access to the main repo, as well as just several other developers that are, have made really important contributions to Bitcoin. And uh, they're all part of Blockstream. So that's everybody's sort of got fingers crossed that Blockstream is going to pull off side chains because we're all very excited about it and it can solve a lot of these issues. So, uh, Greg Maxwell, Matt uh, Corallo, uh, uh, Mark Friedenbach, um, Peter Wool, these are all uh, you know, core developers at Blockstream. Is that implementable now without any changes to the block, uh, Bitcoin protocol? So, Unfortunately, to really fully, in, in a completely decentralized way, implement sidechains, there is a change to the Bitcoin protocol that you have to make. Um, I think there's a way to do it that's a soft fork, so I'm not totally up to speed on it, but you do have to change the protocol, because there has to be a way to lock up the Bitcoins, and then retrieve them on the sidechain. The sidechain can do whatever it wants to do. It can retrieve them however it wants. But how do you lock up the Bitcoins on the Bitcoin blockchain, and then how do you retrieve them after they've been unlocked? Um, this requires like the, the part of like unveiling or like getting them back on the Bitcoin blockchain involves uh, processing a proof that they've been locked up on the sidechain, which is just something that I don't think you can even do this right now in, in the Bitcoin scripting language. For one thing, you'd have to have a really long script. The script has to contain a proof, and the proof is potentially something like 40 kilobytes, or I think it might be more than that, I don't, I don't know how many kilobytes, but quite large, well over the 500 byte size of a script. So there's that change. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what other opcodes op and stuff they have to use. I don't know if the Bitcoin language is, is powerful enough to support it. So unfortunately, there is a change that has to be made to Bitcoin. But if they sort of pull this off, and people are very excited about, big, uh, about block side chains, and they solve all these issues. You can send faster transactions. You can do fancy scripts. Um, I think they'll be able to achieve consensus and probably change the Bitcoin protocol to, to add support for this. It's not necessarily a huge change, but it's a very important change. And no one likes to change the Bitcoin protocol lightly. Yes. Um, what was the Bitcoin glitch that brought down Mt. Gox? No. Oh, okay, so what was the Bitcoin glitch that brought down Mt. Gox? I would first start by saying that Mt. Gox brought down themselves for many, many, many reasons. Um, now, you're probably asking about uh, transaction malleability, which is, I think, like, basically as soon as Mt. Gox, it's a, it's a long story. They're, they're, you, somebody, you, you, could, you could go over the... the Fascinating, there could be a movie written about just Mt. Gox. Um, but when it was like, finally just basically died, like they stopped delivering dollars or Bitcoin. You couldn't withdraw dollars or Bitcoin. You couldn't withdraw Bitcoin anymore. People were like, uh-oh, you know, what, what happens? And Mark Carpellis, who's you know, CEO of, of Mt. Gox, is like, well, there's a, there's a bug in Bitcoin. Uh, there's transactions can be malleable. And everybody like, really, like, come on, a bug in Bitcoin. We all knew this was possible. You just didn't know this and like wrote a service that depended on you know not the, the non-existence of this transaction malleability. So what transaction malleability is, um, when you have an input to a transaction, you refer to a previous transaction by using its hash. Well, the 
signatures and a few other components of the, of the uh, uh, input scripts in a transaction can actually be changed and still be valid. So for instance, in a, uh, in a multi-sig transaction, you have an op zero at the start. The op zero doesn't have to be an op zero. It can be pushing any data to the stack. It actually doesn't matter, and it's still valid. So you can push the number five, you can push 10, um, whatever. There's endless variety in what you can push and still be a valid transaction. Um, if someone takes your transaction, it's a valid transaction, you are spending, um, you know, it could be like a, uh, I guess it would have to be, yeah, you're outputting to a, uh, you know, an output script that's multi-sig. They can take that op zero and turn it into an op one, and it's still actually valid, but any transactions that come later depend on the hash of that transaction, which is now completely different because you changed that one byte value and now the hash is just different. Um, so this is an unfortunate feature of Bitcoin that this is true. The way this should have worked is the inputs to transactions should not simply be the hash of the transaction. It should be the hash of the transaction with the malleable parts blanked out or replaced with constant values. So in other words, uh, for op check multi or for multi-sig, when you hash a transaction, it should always replace whatever that zero is, because it doesn't matter what it is, with a zero. Or if it's a five, it replaces it with zero. If it's a six, it replaces it with zero. And then hashes it, so you always get the same value for the hash. And that's not how Bitcoin was designed. So unfortunately, the situation is that if you try to spend an unconfirmed transaction, someone can change the transaction that was not confirmed. Uh, into a different transaction, so that your transaction that depends on it is now invalid. Um, even if the original transaction gets in a block, it's not the same transaction anymore. It has a totally different hash. Um, so, so that's it. So that's transaction malleability. Um, and uh, it's just a feature of the Bitcoin protocol that means, I guess in a nutshell, it's really difficult to send uh, uh, payments that depend on unconfirmed transactions. Take one more question. Make it a good one. <laughs> Someone who's not asked a question yet? Don't everybody talk at the same time? <laughs> you should have asked uh, before the, the, the last question. <laughs> Tim? This is actually great. Thank you. Good job. Okay, let's give it up. Ryan Charles. Thanks, so much. Thanks to BitGo for having me. So, um, we'll now have a tour uh, by Rich Bodo of the Innovation Lab. And we'll have lunch at 12.30 and resume uh, 